Good morning, good afternoon, good evening to everybody in our audience. Uh, we're very pleased to present this uh, webinar today. Um, this is the first joint webinar presented by the National Group of the USA, which I chair, and the National Group of Canada, uh, chaired by Mike Bartlett, who is co-hosting the seminar with me. So next, IAPS's mission is uh, to exchange knowledge and advance the practice of structural engineering worldwide. Uh, IAPS has uh, more than 2,500 members in 100 countries. And the real special thing about our organization is that we cover all sorts of structures, all sorts of uh, all the phases of, of uh, structural engineering and construction and that we span all over the world and uh, that brings great value to meetings uh, such as this one because it they allow to uh, exchange information uh, beyond what is the practice of um, of each individual member's uh, country um one of the benefits uh, that you get as an IAPSI member is uh, access to publications that, again, uh, they span the worldwide practice. Uh, you have the journal issued several times a year, uh, the IAPSI bulletins, which are more based in um, case studies or, or single subjects, and they um, include a lot of uh, really great information. And then of course the conference proceedings. Um, I, I need to uh, point out that uh, the call for membership renewals went out last week, I believe. And I want to encourage everybody who is a member to renew uh, promptly and everybody who's listening to us and attending this event and who is not a member, to consider uh, joining the organization. Um, one of the most valuable aspects of, of the organization is the technical commissions and the task groups. Uh, the technical, there are six technical commissions, the, their subjects are listed here, and there are over 40 task groups. And the task groups are a very interesting concept because they are tasked with a very specific um, um, objective or, or deliverable that they need to produce within two to four years, so a relatively short uh, time span, um, after which the task group dissolves and maybe members regroup and work on a different objective, a different deliverable. So that's that's a very enriching part of the organization, and I, I am, and I like to uh, encourage everybody to attend. Mike? Yeah, thanks. Sorry, I'm having odd problems with my computer and advancing slides. There we go. Um, yeah. IAPSI holds webinars and conferences. Uh, the webinars are recorded and the recordings are made available uh, to members uh, online. Uh, the 2023 conferences include the Long Span Bridge Conference uh, Symposium next April in Istanbul and the IAPSI uh, Congress in New Delhi next September. The call for abstracts for New Delhi has been extended until November 30th, so I encourage you to consider submitting a proposal as soon as possible. There, now it's working. Um, IAPSI's got a very active young engineers group uh, and uh, encourages student membership. So uh, the benefits are on this slide. Take a screenshot if you're interested. Um, those attending this webinar may be particularly interested in the activities of IABC Task Group 6.1, Effects of Climate Change on Infrastructures. So the mission statements and objectives uh, are also shown on this slide. If you're interested, grab a screenshot. So back to you, Maria. Thank you. So as I said, um, I'm the chair of the USA National Group. Um, on last April, we installed a new board of directors. I hope that uh, many of you will recognize uh, several of the names, especially if you're listening to us from the um, from the US. 
uh, feel free to reach out to any of us if you have any ideas on how we can make uh, the IAPSI national group in the US more active. Uh, on this slide, you see some of the activities we have planned. Uh, this is our very first webinar in conjunction with the, the Canadian group. Uh, but we are planning some events in person uh, for next year, including a continuation of the series of Future of Design, which was a very successful series um, that took place in New York and, of course, was cut off a little bit by COVID. Um, so watch this space for more uh, events. Uh, look uh, for our newsletter, which is sent on a regular basis and contact us. Back to you, Mike. Great. So the Canadian group has been uh, relatively dormant recently, but we're starting to plan activities for 2023. Uh, we're excited to be working with the U.S. National Group on online uh, webinars. I hope we can rebuild the board of directors and maybe hold a virtual student conference uh, sometime next year. So now it's time to introduce our speakers. Oh, before I say this, I should remind you that there is a Q&A button on your Zoom uh, control. And so if you've got a question, we'll have a Q&A session at the end of the presentation. If you've got a question, please submit it in the Q&A and uh, we'll know to find it there and ask our speakers about it. Um, I'm inviting Derek and Guy perhaps to turn on your microphones and cameras and to introduce you both quickly. Uh, Dr. Guy LaRose is a specialist in wind engineering and bridge aerodynamics with more than 30 years experience in this field, both in North America and in Europe. Uh, he's made engineering contributions to some of the world's tallest structures and longest bridges, and his recent work has focused on aerodynamic shaping to reduce sensitivity to flow structure interactions of bridges and slender structures, wind-induced vibrations of cables, and sport aerodynamics. Uh, Derek Kelly is a senior project manager at RWDI, a graduate of the University of Western Ontario and McMaster. Uh, he's also uh, extensive experience in the design and construction of bridges and high-rise uh, high buildings. Uh, at RWDI, he's been involved with uh, project leadership from financial management to quality assurance, and Derek enjoys the experience of collaborating with clients, steering their projects to successful uh, conclusions. Uh, Guy and Derek, uh, I'll stop sharing. The floor is yours. Please proceed. Thanks, Mike. Uh, let me just share my screen. Thank you, everybody. Um, I'll go into presentation mode. Are you seeing the correct screen? Not yet. Okay, let me do this again. Okay, good. Not quite. No, we're not getting anything. Okay. Let me try this again. There you go. Okay. We hit presentation mode. Okay. How's that? We need to change the display setting, please, as we did in the... Okay. At the, at the top, Derek. Top, medium, left. There's uh, the tab that says display settings. Oh, there we go. Sorry. There, that's the one. That's good. You got it. All right. Sorry about that, everybody. Um, so thanks for having us today. Uh, Mike gave us an introduction already. Um, both Guy and I work at RWDI. Our head office uh, is in Guelph, Ontario, just outside Toronto. We're a multidisciplinary firm. We have almost 800 employees, just over 750, and we've done projects all over the world. Here's just an overview of some of the offices we've had. We have, sorry, we've expanded uh, quite a bit in the last decade. I would say into Asia uh, and Australia, with an office in Shanghai, one in Kuala Lumpur, and then several offices throughout North America, and um, one in the UK and one in Milan, Italy. Um, so the topic of the day is to, uh, talking about um, understanding the local climate and how it interacts with slender structures and long span bridges. So the first thing is really to understand 
what is happening within the climate. So we can do a statistical analysis. This is just taken from Logan Airport in Boston. And it's really to understand uh, the distribution of wind, uh, the frequency of wind, the strength. So if I say a wind is blowing 30 miles an hour, well, how often does 30 miles an hour occur? And does that occur at grade level or does it occur at the top of the building? And then um, temperature, how hot is it gonna be? How humid is it gonna be? All of these things we can get from uh, available data. And I would say in Western Europe and in North America, the quality of data has become exceptionally good uh, over the last 20 years specifically. Um, we can then break up the frequency. This is just a, another directional distribution uh, throughout different seasons of the year, because you can see, again, this is Boston, but in the lower right-hand corner, uh, they tend to get Boston. If you've ever been there in January, and for those that are from the area, it's fairly unpleasant in January, and it, it can get very, very strong winds from uh, the west northwest and from the southwest as well. Uh, these are nor'easters tracking from the Gulf up through uh, the United States and out into the eastern seaboard, and it carries a lot of moisture with it. So when it hits New England, it tends to dump a lot of snow. So we want to understand these climatic uh, characteristics. And nowadays with, uh, as I said, the quality of data on, on really a regional scale, um, you can downscale that to very fine increments into one kilometer, even 10 meter resolution to understand what's happening spatially uh, in a given location. So it's, in a way, I would say uh, weather analysis or statistical uh, climate analysis, it's almost like a large finite element model. You can envision this grid over North America or Western Europe, and that grid also varies spatially vertically. Um, so from that, we can interpolate and really understand the climate at a very fine scale. And then from this, this is just a uh, uh, plot of wind speed versus return period. And again, this kind of describes, at least when we see it, what is the strength of the wind and how often does it occur? Um, so the red line is a one hour mean. That's just the average wind speed averaged over a uh, over an hour period. And then this is actually for a bridge at some of the longer return periods, the 1,000 and 10,000 year, we look at shorter duration for aerodynamic stability. And that would be something like flutter, like what happened with the original Tacoma Narrows Bridge. Does the bridge go into flutter? And we wanna make sure if flutter does occur, it occurs at such a long return period that essentially statistically you're saying it will never happen. So this is a very important uh, plot in terms of reliability and the frequency of occurrence of wind. Also, the direction uh, is very important. This just shows a directional distribution. You can see these are different return periods. The circular one, it says all winds, but that's essentially winds blowing over, you know, one kilometer an hour, one mile per hour, and it captures everything uh, above that. And then you can see the mechanics of the wind for this particular site. This is actually the Golden Gate Bridge, and it's almost a line north-south. And um, you can see a big lobe comes from the southwest as uh, as the wind uh, mechanics of the wind start to dominate. It tends to converge, and this is not unlike most climates. Uh, you'll see that they tend to, the wind comes from one area. In areas of the Great Lakes Basin, uh, we'll often want to know what. Uh, wind directions bring snow with it or what wind directions bring um, rain. So that's also important. One other thing is to understand how the climate is changing. This has come up, I would say, on a, on a project-related basis. Um, but in North America, um, RWDI was involved in uh, writing the new National Building Code, and we did a quite a comprehensive uh, climate analysis. And one thing, one trend that's occurred is as the region is, as North America is warming, we're actually changing different climate zones. So you can see a climate zone of different climates on the right that shows a map. But in several years in the Eastern uh, United States and uh, the Great Lakes Basin, we're actually gonna be more akin to what's in South Carolina uh, by 2040, 2050 as, as things begin to warm. What that means though is, uh, for the Great Lakes area, um, 
uh, with the Great Lakes not freezing, you now have a lot of excess moisture. So it's predicted that for the next hundred years, uh, snow loads will actually go up because you're creating more moisture and the Great Lakes uh, won't have frozen over. And one other trend we'll see that Guy will touch on is uh, freezing rain rates have increased in uh, the central or midwestern United States and in Ontario and Quebec. That's been a trend for about the last decade, uh, which freezing rain, as everybody knows, isn't very pleasant. Um, so how does climate influence design? So as I said, you really, you have to get an understanding of what is happening within the climate. What is going on with the frequency of wind and, and snow and how does this affect our structures? So we've got, Guy and I have a few case studies. This one uh, is probably a sensationalized example being such a tall building, but we did a lot of wind engineering studies on this project, 432 Park Avenue. And it's a very tall, slender building at 57th and Park Avenue in New York. And when we first studied it as a solid structure, the motions were exceptionally high, the across wind response. That's where the wind is blowing into one of the faces, say the north, so, uh, north face, and the building is oscillating in the east-west direction. That's called the across wind response. And that can create quite high motions uh, for the occupants and the um, and quite severe demands in terms of wind loading on the bridge. So we need to understand what are the prevailing winds for New York? What is the strength of wind? And then also we looked at shaping uh, the uh, building and the wind tunnels. So the architect and the developer came up for a day. Um, we had three models of the tower. We tested about 14 versions in a day. So while one was testing, we're modifying the other. And we ended up with this version with these horizontal bands. So if you go to New York, you see the building, it's lit up at night. These horizontal bands are, are lit up. But what it really does is it helps break up and confuse the wind shedding off the building, really disrupt that across wind response. But the benefit is rather than overcoming the demands on the building by adding steel or adding concrete or increasing um, you know, the structural capacity of the building, we were able to uh, reduce the demands on the building, reduce the wind loads on the building, so that if you looked at the response versus wind speed, it's almost a flat line response. So it's almost insensitive to wind speed now. And we also, thereby reducing the amount of steel that goes into the building, um, you can reduce the carbon footprint. And we reduce the tower motions uh, for the occupants. So you can see here's a few different versions uh, that got tested in the wind tunnel. A similar story for the Shanghai Tower. This one I think is probably even more interesting because Thornton Tomasetti, uh, who we, are, we work with quite a bit at RWDI, uh, they did a parallel calculation for the building code. Um, and here's, a, I'll just show you a few different versions, but because in China, um, everything is overseen by a, an expert panel review and they wanna know how it compares to the code Thornton Tomaseri carried a parallel design based on the wind tunnel test results and based on the building code in China and concluded that they were able to save 13,000 tons of steel or $60 million in structure by using the wind tunnel results rather than the code. So there was a desire to save money on the project, but the reality is when we think about climate, we were able to reduce the carbon footprint uh, that the building imposes on the um, on the environment. And we didn't change the architecture. The architects designed the building and that's what architects are good at, making things look good. But we did look at a number of different twists and tapers. And you can see these are different versions. And the final version on the right doesn't look terribly different from where we started out from, the second from the left. And we compared it to a tapered box because that's what the building code thinks is that you have this box and that's what the expert panel wanted to see when we did sort of a peer review process in China. Um, in terms of overturning moments, when we compare it to the tapered box, you can just see here um, the ratio on resultant overturning moment. We were able to reduce the base loads by uh, 33%. So this is just looking at a different twist. The, they call it a zipper. The architect called it a zipper. That's that sort of line that wraps around the building as it goes up in elevation. Um, I think we ended off at about 120 degrees, sort of where 
you know, twisting 120 degrees up the uh, body of the building and slightly rotating it uh, to be optimized with the prevailing winds in Shanghai. Um, what this means, and this is kind of the punchline, but when I get back to that 13,000 tons of steel that was saved, this is over 20,000 tons of carbon. And we compared it to three buildings in Toronto that we've worked on uh, of the same carbon equivalent. And this is the equivalent of three high rise towers. So I realize that the, when I say 13,000 tons of steel, that's kind of an abstract number. What does it mean? Well, it's the equivalent of the total carbon that's put into these three buildings in Toronto. So it's a significant savings in terms of the potential impact it would have on the climate. So shaping and thinking about how a building interacts within its environment uh, just doesn't save the developer money. It can actually have a substantially beneficial impact on the environment. This is just, um, for those that know, steel is hugely energy intensive to make steel. Um, and there's different tactics that can be used from manufacturing uh, steel to how it's transported to the site. So this is just sort of a, thinking ahead uh, in terms of using steel. Um, now we need, do need a lot of these products still to run a modern economy, but there are some that are better. You can see on the right side of, of the graph, that's the total tonnage of carbon that's used to go into manufacturing some of these uh, different materials. You can see timber is, is substantially better, whereas aluminum and steel are quite, um, quite involved in terms of both energy and emissions required to, uh, to manufacture them or to fabricate them. Um, I'll turn it over to my colleague, Guy. So Guy, you just tell me when to advance a slide since I'm driving still. Okay, <clears throat> thank you, Derek. Thank you very much. Yeah, so I will make a parallel to um, what Derek has said from going from buildings to bridges. And definitely uh, in most cases, when you look at long span bridges, the, the governing loads is the wind load. So no matter what you do from the start, the climate, the wind climate will influence the design. But there's also other parameters that becomes uh, that comes uh, at play in, in here. So what you have here on this slide is the holistic approach that we like to use at WDI when we deal with uh, with uh, wind studies with long span bridges. It always starts with the first ingredient, which is the microclimate. Try to define very well the the climate of strong winds, uh, as well as other parameters like icing and snow. And if, uh, if it's not so well defined, then maybe sometimes we have to do topographic model study just to understand really uh, the, the strength of wind, where it comes from, and uh, the, the return periods for the strong winds. Then the next thing is we look at the aerodynamics of the structure itself, and that's what we call shaping for aerodynamic stability. So we are given a, a cross-section, we work with the designer, we're giving a cross-section. Our role is to understand if there is risk of instability, and if there is instability to come up with an experimental approach or a miracle approach or CFD, at least to, to make sure that the structure at the end, the deck itself or the deck in combination the deck with barriers and fences is stable. So we work with the wind and then we then try to, to, to make sure that the, the structure is stable. Once we have a stable structure, then we go in and we'll measure aerodynamic force coefficient or the information that is needed to be able to predict the wind loads using a, a buffeting analysis or uh, uh, simulation of the of the over the wind effect on the structure to come up with the set of wind loads so that's a classic approach uh, it's the same for buildings but this one really has an important because there's really high risk of instability so there's possibility for long span ridges to 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 change to change to actually having the wind deciding what it's, the deck is going to look like in the end um, then the other aspect we looked at is cable vibration uh, help the, the owner with rear vehicle or rollover studies, understanding as well the risk of uh, pedestrian vibrations, the comfort of the vehicles, the comfort of the pedestrian walking on the bridge um, to, to induce vibration. And then dampers, sometimes we need to have dampers, sometimes, and then finally this field test. So the whole, this is the whole approach that is used for, for bridges. And it's always start with where, uh, about the wind, the wind climate itself. Can you change the slides? Yes, thank you. So 
uh, when we we work on bridges like this, there's always a, a, some element of the that is dictated by codes. Um, most of the projects will have a brief, will have a, a, a project descriptions and, and an agreement with the, the contractors, but they will always refer to codes. So what you get in codes is really what define uh, a, a structure as being wind sensitive, definitely comes from the code. You get the, from the code, the definition of return periods for the design that is used either for, for wind or icing or snow, but the, this is defined uh, definitely the, from, from the code itself. You get the load combination and load, uh, load factors to be used for design. You also get criteria uh, in terms of acceleration for comfort of the users of the bridge at the, as a function of wind speed. And uh, sometimes, uh, you, not all, actually all the time, you get design wind speeds from maps and also accretion of thickness from maps. Uh, in some cases, you don't have to use those maps. Uh, I will explain why. Next slide, please. So what is a wind sensitive structure? Uh, everything that the, in, in the case of Ashto and in the case also for Eurocode, what's, what is a wind sensitive structure is basically all cable supported bridge are, are considered wind sensitive. That means if they are wind sensitive, that means most of the, the dominant load will be coming from the wind. And uh, if you also have a structure that is a, a large span to depth ratio larger than 30, so really slender structure, or you have a very, very vertical or translation periods of less uh, of more than one second, so less than than one hertz. That structure is considered flexible. So if you have a flexible structure, the code will tell you that um, it is in the interest of the design team to actually uh, consult specialists to and, and and you are in sort of in in a realm of a performance driven design. So you really have to you you. You uh, have to follow the current practice, but you don't have to follow the code in terms of design, designing how you're going to, to, to reach the, the, the final goal. So next slide, please. So in, in terms of um, perform, there's still, some, there's still some regulation, there's still a return period that you have to use that, they are, that are coming from the analysis of the site. But in, in, in most cases for bridges, you can actually come up with the climate site specific, specific studies that will tell you, that will, uh, that will inform you what is the design wind speed to be used uh, that has associated with a certain return period. And also the type of uh, ice accretion and snow accumulation that you can have specifically for the site. And that just in itself can actually come up with pretty big savings, typically, the wind speed that will come from analysis like this will probably reduce um, the, the design wind speed from by 10, 15% sometimes, which has that impact on, on the loads. Uh, this type of study is also very important when it comes to topography. If you have a, like the site that you see, this is a picture on the, on the right-hand side is a, is a planned view or satellite view of a site um, of a bridge near Cornwall in the UK. And very, very, uh, very complex topography, and the only way really to come up with uh, a good measurement of defining of the, the wind speed for site and turbulence level was actually to do a topography model study. That type of studies also are really uh, a historical approach to look at hurricanes is really important actually to look at well as well as not. Um, if you use a code, it's there is definitely a risk associated with this. Next slide, please. So once you, you're in a situation like this, you have a cable supported bridge. This is a, this is a I395 signature bridge in Miami. Well, if you, when you start the study, really it, the, 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 the focus on the study or the wind study is really looking at the performance of, of the bridge in where it, it is in this case, downtown Miami, uh, really close to the ocean and uh, in a hurricane zone. Really, that's dominate the whole structure and the whole study and everything has to focus on understanding uh, the impact of that. Next slide. So the other example I would like to show, it's, um, this is uh, some views, some artist uh, views of the Gordiao International Bridge. This is a very important bridge that is being in, in constructed right now largest cable steel bridge uh, in North America, 853 meter, uh, joining, uh, joining Canada, joining Windsor, uh, Canada to, to Detroit, uh, Michigan. 
um, really this bridge has uh, so many elements that are related to, 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 to the climate. Of course, the wind climate, understanding where the wind come from. Um, there is, a, it's a bridge that is, uh, um, it's a border crossing. So there will be cars, they might be stuck there on, on, at the border for a little while. Uh, they, there's gonna be also cyclists and pedestrians. And the idea is to protect the pedestrians from the strong winds. Uh, so that you see on the lower uh, picture, there's a very tall fence that is that is planned for the structure. Uh, the question that was raised in this case is, uh, due to climate change, the risk of having uh, freezing air events in the Windsor, Detroit area has increased quite a lot in the last 10 years and continue to, to increase. So the idea is here was to come up with a way of making fence that would protect uh, the, the, the user of the bridge and as well as preventing from people from, from jumping from the bridge to actually cross the border. Uh, but you want to make sure that you will not create instability. And so the design of the fence itself has been really this studied uh, in details in the wind tunnel to be able to come up with uh, um, something that is going to be efficient and it's, gonna, it's not gonna become a wall of ice and can create instability. The same with the cables. The cable had to be really uh, looked in detail, the, the, the risk of icing and freezing rain. Um, and uh, they would, that, that's as when you would cross the bridge, you'll see that they have, they, they have a big set of dampers and the dampers are there just to really be able to make sure that the, 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 the stability of the, the cables is gonna be maintained even with risk of freezing rain. Okay, next slide. Uh, so this is a, a rendering of the uh, of the uh, Gordial Bridge, and it is something. This is a tool that has been developed uh, at ODI, and what we are actually doing in here. So we're combining the infect information that we get from the from the wind. So the we make a modeling of the of the wind uh, wind uh, turbulence and wind speed. So that's the small vectors that you see coming out of the of the cable. And then we combine this formation with the structural uh, dynamics, the, the, the dynamics of the structure, and we model the bridge in small slices. And for each of the slices, we associate uh, a mass and an aerodynamic properties. And then uh, we solve the equation of motion and say, this is the wind we have, this is a structure that you're hitting, what kind of uh, response you would get. So we simulate 100, uh, we said one hour, of wind storms, but we simulate 21 hours. Define over those 21 uh, storms, what kind of response you will get. And then at some point we define, okay, this is the envelope of the response that we have measured, that we have uh, simulated. And what kind of loading do I need to be able to reach to, to get that deformation? So if you can show this next slide, uh, Derek. Yeah, so that's an example. For example, this is a deformation uh, the uplift at mid span. So, what kind of loading do I need to apply to my structure to obtain this deformed shape? And I think we have another one. This is the downforce at mid span as well. So, what kind of loading do I need to apply on the deck and on the on the pylon to get that deformed maximum deflection that we have seen? So, this we combine this information from the buffeting analysis, the response combine this information into, into a loading that is used for the design. So directly coming from, from the main ingredients, the wind, the dynamics of the structure and, uh, and the aerodynamics of it. Uh, next slide. So just, uh, just to say a few words as well about fences. One thing that we have seen uh, in, in recently in North America, um, owners would like to install uh, means terrain fences on those on those bridges, and there's different ways of doing it. If you're going to be in a situation where you can have uh, risk of freezing rain, it's really you have to pay attention of the type of porosity that you will you will have. Uh, and nowadays we have freezing rain all the way down to to Texas and North Carolina. So so it is really quite a quite an important uh, element to consider. So the next slide, please. We, 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 we realize based on experiment in a icing wind tunnel that uh, you can simulate well the storms or the, the, the what you call radial ice thickness. And what it does on the different 
on the different types of fences. And here, this case is with pickets. You can do the same experiment also on, on chain link fences. And those ones tend to be really uh, become blocked by wind, uh, by ice very quickly. So uh, next slide. So that graph here shows on the on the y-axis the porosity. So uh, the yeah porosity is the inverse of solidity as a function of the ice accretion. The blue line is for a chain link fence, and then the red the red line is for vertical picket. So of course the vertical the vertical picket or rods will be much more um, more more friendly when it comes to icing than the the, the, the chain link fence. But the next slide, the reason I'm talking about this is because if you have this, this, uh, this curve that shows how the flutter speed of a, of a long span bridge can be really affected by how much, uh, how much blockage you'll have into the fence. Uh, this case here, we had uh, just um, with 18 millimeter of, of uh, freezing rain, which is more or less the design parameter for New York City. Uh, you will go from uh, from 50 meter per second uh, instability down to to 28. So really, really important that uh, this is this needs to be taken into account when you look at uh, instability of long span bridges. The next, yeah. So that that slide. The idea, though, we have to be look at this in a very smart way. So this is a graph of ice accretion as a function of flutter speed, flutter speed as a function of ice accretion. And what we have to look at, it's a joint probability of occurrence. Like you're not looking at the strongest wind and the most maximum ice and combining and defining what is the, the limit. You really have to look at, well, those are extreme events and you have to actually, uh, you actually consider that the risk of happening at the same time are really low. So then you can actually evaluate, if you know the probability of the sooner of each, you can actually evaluate the joint probability and define where you stand in terms of your risk. And this is when the code helps you. The code will tell you, okay, this is what the structure that needs to be built. This is a level of risk that we, as we can assume. And that's what you use as a, a, as a, as a prescriptive approach. Next slide, please. Uh, we, next thing that we look at uh, when we're looking at that, the issues of icing is also the performance of the cable. Um, we are equipped now to go on site, and this is something that we do for most every bridges. And once the bridge is built, uh, before opening, uh, we will go on site and measure the frequency and the damping of each of the cable, or at least the selections of cable to see if it adheres to what was was defined. And uh, sometimes, uh, the next slide. Sometimes we, we face question like this, conditions like this that happened in Vancouver where you had accumulation of ice and snow on, on the cable. And uh, next slide, they, the, they, it created slush bombs. Uh, not, it was not parts of ice, it was not uh, debris of ice, it was really bombs of really wet snow falling on the, on the traffic. And this is a really difficult problem to solve. Um, the, there's yet not a very elegant solution to solve it, but one of the most important one is really to, it's knowledge base, is to actually try to predict when those events will happen and close the line, the lane or a few lanes um, when you do your bridge management system to, to, to be able to define. That's a, that's a, this, that study in, in terms of the, the portman was also carried out in wind tunnels to try to understand how, uh, you know, what was the phenomenon that was happening and the definition of those slush bombs and, and when could, couldn't they happen. The idea was to come, to use the wind tunnel to define what happened and then use the statistical analysis on site temperature change, wind speed and a, a high thickness of wet snow occurrence and predict how many times it could happen in, in, in a year or several years. Next slide. This will. This is a case study that yeah, Derek is the specialist on that bridge. Let's go, Derek. <laughs> as as yours. Yeah, this is uh, Tappan Zee Bridge, uh, which is over the Hudson. I believe it's been renamed to Mario Cuomo Bridge. And uh, similar to the other case studies I presented for the Shanghai Center in 432 Park, we helped 
the design team optimize the shape and help save some money on the project and then um, uh, helped with uh, vehicle blowover studies. So um, this is a video that shows this was the initial design of Tappan Zee Bridge and it had very bluff barriers at the um, at the outer edges. Now this looks quite violent. Uh, so the time scale in the wind tunnels sped up a little bit so the bridges wouldn't be moving this quickly at full scale, but you can see the wind is shedding off the upwind one and interacting with the downwind bridge adversely. And this is this translates into a big vortex shedding response. So if you look at the plot in the lower uh, graphs, you have uh, peak vertical response and uh, peak torsional response. This is of the downwind deck. And then these are all solid barriers as depicted in the upper um, graph. And, and uh, it, serendipitously, each bridge is about um, uh, almost exactly the same width of B, and they're separated almost by the same distance B. So the wake of the upwind bridge has time to organize and adversely influence the downwind bridge. So what we ended up doing was adding or replacing those solid barriers with open barriers and putting a baffle plate down the middle of each. And you can see the response in green. It now basically eliminates or kills the vortex shedding. So the bridge is very safe to drive across, very safe for users, very safe for, for pedestrians. But when I get back to that, um, idea of saving steel and saving carbon, when we also look at the drag and the lift um, or the lateral loading and the lift on the deck, because of the open barriers, the loads actually reduce significantly 20 to 30, 20, 30, 40% on the bridge. So I do remember the foundations were able to, to be better optimized and reduce the amount of piles um, under each of the pylons or under each of the towers. Um, so this translates into a, a, a net savings of both concrete and steel, but also carbon. The reason I keep mentioning carbon is it's now a metric and most governments now have a levy or a tax of some form on carbon. And this is real and not going away anytime soon. And in fact, accounting software that we use um, and many accounting softwares now have the ability to track carbon. So this is a measurable, definable thing that will be um, will stay with us for the rest of our lifetime and become more prevalent. So saving carbon and reducing the carbon impact of structures is one thing that can be done when we really think about how the structure interacts with its environment. And that is it for Guy and I. So we'll take any questions. Um, Mike, Maria, I don't know if you wanted to add anything or to have open the floor for questions. Absolutely, yes. Thank you so much for such an interesting presentation. And uh, it's great to see a couple of bridges that I, I've uh, even participated uh, on. Um, yeah, so we have uh, just a reminder that uh, for anybody who wants to ask a question, please type them in the Q&A. Uh, sesh, uh, section on uh, at the bottom of your screen, you should see Q and A. Just uh, type the question, and we'll um, uh, we'll present them to Guy and uh, Derek. Um, so, um, let, first question uh, would be: Is the climate change um, that we're seeing? Uh, enough to really result in a change of the design of the structures, especially this long span and these um, very high buildings? Yeah, I'll, I'll take a first crack at that. I don't think we're, we're not seeing an appreciable difference in wind speed per se or frequency um, based on some studies that have, have been done. But like and I said, I think probably one of the most notable ones, you have temperature increase for sure. And then in the Great Lakes area, which um, for those that don't know on the call, the moisture from the Great Lakes area affects everything in the Northeastern 
United States all the way out to um, New York. Um, and with with this, you the snow loads are predicted to increase over the next say 100 years in that area because the Great Lakes won't freeze, but also with climate change, uh, freezing rain rates uh, have gone up by about 80% in the Midwest and, and central, uh, you know, Southern Ontario and Quebec. So this has a tremendous implication on structures. Um, the wind speed, and I'll let Guy chime in, it's not of the studies we've seen or participate in, we're not seeing um, changes in wind speeds per se. In fact, in some cases, they've even gone down in certain areas. I know it's sensationalized in the media that things are becoming more violent and the wind speeds are going up. And every time you see a hurricane on the news, it's, it's bigger than before. I don't know if that's actually true. Um, but I think one thing is, and what we tried to convey is that if you think about, um, if the wind load is the controlling factor on a tall building or a long span bridge, it governs the overturning moments. It governs the motions for the occupants. If you think about shape, whether it be a bridge deck or a tall building, you can actually optimize it to work with the climate rather than against it. And if you do that, you typically save your client money, but then you can also have a, a measurable impact, a beneficial impact on the reduction of carbon or material that would go into building that. Yeah, no, definitely. I, I agree with you 100%, Derek. Like you, since the wind load is so important and you, you, if you come up with criteria that you want to meet, the idea is that you can work on the aerodynamics and you can work on the design to meet those criteria. Uh, and come up with an efficient building at the same time they will will be will be uh will save will save carbon if it's uh, done properly and in terms of climate clearly the climate is changed relative to flood uh, i mean i live in ottawa we have many rivers i think every in the last five years we had four times four times the 100 year return flood you know so okay. Of course, something is something is wrong. It should happen only once in one year, not every every right. every year. So, definitely, there's way more. The, the, there's more. There's more water when it comes to flood. There's definitely uh, the the uh, the intensity of the rain is becomes it has increased a lot. In terms of uh, of wind, I'm involved with the Canadian um, uh, Highway Bridge Code. Uh, we are going to have new clause, but it is moderate. We see an increase. Definitely, we see an increase, but it's nothing like flood. It's nothing like flood, and it depends on the scenario. I think we are uh, people are involved in this defining the climate change impact, and we're looking at a temperature change of one and a half degree or two and a half degree. Depends on which scenario you use, but it's still it's still moderate, so it's still manageable. Great. Yeah. I have a, we have a couple of other questions that have come from the audience. Um, so the first one is uh, for long span bridges in particular, how often does a climatology report need to be updated or verified? So I, I imagine this question refers to the service life of a, of a uh, large span. Um, would you go back and, and uh, update your climatology report like after 10 years or so? Uh, no, not necessarily, but um, most bridges nowadays have would have like a meteorological station on them. Of the ones we've worked on, uh, the certainly the wind speeds have compared quite well to the climatology study. Um, usually, I, I would say from a strength design perspective or from a design perspective, the uh, bridge is designed to withstand a, a significant wind event, um, you know, on the order of uh, a, a 2000 year event or 5000 year event, depending on the return period and the jurisdiction it's in. But um, from a serviceability perspective, uh, you know, uh, the climatology study typically would have spoken about common winds, common snow events, common rain that uh, are meant for the usage of the bridge. I wouldn't say these are typically updated, um, but uh, you know, uh, 
I don't know, Guy, if you have anything to add to that. Uh, it depends on the location. If it's um, if there's a location that is related to uh, tropical climates with hurricanes, it's probably worth it to redo this the the climb the, the the simulation for hurricanes because um, the models are getting better and better uh, each time. There's there's a season passing. It's just knowledge that has been gained in terms of uh, understanding those those storms. So I would say a period of 10 years for sure, like maybe not two years, but you know, five, 10 years, I will redo the, the hurricane simulation. In terms of the wind, would be, it would be more a question as something's changed in the area um, related to the project in terms of buildings and, and the build environment or near the anemometer. This is always a question. This is always a question like we have a project in Paris now and people are questioning the value of the wind speed at Charles de Gaulle Airport. You know, the best, <laughs> the, probably one of the busiest uh, European airport. And people are questioning because Paris is not what it used to be in the last 50 years. It has changed. And uh, so, so people are looking at those statistics and say, okay, maybe you have to pay attention to that. Great. Well, we have a, a question that I think is somewhat related. Um, when a bridge or a tall building is already constructed and later on, if their surrounding event, environment is changed, may cause the worldwide phenomena, in such cases, what would be the solution? Yeah, so we actually have a couple of projects like this, exactly the same question. We have a bridge, working a bridge in Australia, in Perth, not in Perth, in Perth, in Sydney. And the, build, the bridge was built in 1989. And it, uh, it was sort of a suburb of, of Sydney. And now it is in the middle of the city in Sydney, like there's big buildings everywhere. And uh, the client, in this case, is the owner of the bridge, is the, the, the transport the New South Wales. And they're looking at, okay, what um, can you tell me if the capacity of the bridge has changed? Is, there, is, uh, the, is this the bridge at, at risk of having more uh, stronger turbulence level or is something has changed? And the question is, you have to go back. We actually are going to build uh, an aeroelastic model of the bridge and put it in the environment it was, it was, it was when it was designed and add all the buildings and um, try to understand the flow pattern on the site. And um, so the question is, okay, what do you do if you end up having too much, if the loaded has increased, then you're a bit in a pickle, but it's better that you know that you don't know. So there's always possibility of changing some of the thing on the bridge to improve the aerodynamics. In this case, it has large fences. You can reduce the fences, you can reduce the traffic, things like that, but it needs to be, uh, we are at the stage where we have cable state bridges that were built uh, 30, 40 years ago. And some of those bridges had a 50 year design life for the cables. And people are looking at, okay, well, the owner is asking, okay, what's maybe time? When do I need to actually do something to the cable? And uh, then those bridges are reopened. You reopen the wind study and you're looking, okay, what has changed? If the environment has changed, the wind climate has changed, then the loading will, will change. So you really have to tackle it uh, uh, in a systematic way. Yeah. Well, we have uh, three more minutes and we um, do have two very interesting questions. Uh, so I hope we can cover them both. And uh, of course, uh, we, we could go a little bit over time. I know that most people will be um you know uh, jumping into other meetings later on or so let's make it um let's try to address them um regarding the video showing the bridge interaction with the wind slide 30 is this video based on reduced scale full bridge wind tunnel tests what part is done numerically could you further describe this simulation Okay, so that's, the buffeting, is, that's the buffeting video, Guy, if you want to describe right. yes. that. Yeah, so the buffeting, yeah, so the buffeting uh, video, so it's entirely numerical simulation. So what we built, we built a numerical model of, of, the, of the bridge itself. So we, that's it, that's the one. So we, we built a numerical model of, 
of the bridge you become sort of a what we call an equivalent uh, or digital twin it's a digital twin of the structure um, and uh, we we simulate a storm of one one hour that will cover the entire span as it can change with uh, the span and also change with height and um, we apply this storm in at uh, we have digitized the bridge in slices so we apply, we, we, we calculate, we, we simulate the wind effect on each of the slices uh, one by one. Uh, and then we solve the equation of motion. We have a, we have a mass matrix of the structure. We have uh, how it responds, what's the frequency matrix of the, of the structure or the output. And then we, we calculate the stiffness. We have now forces, we apply forces to the stiffness and it deflects. So it's hundred it's hundred percent numerical, um, and it's is validated in each of the projects we have. When we actually have a, a topo, uh, like an aeroelastic model study, we will actually simulate in the wind tunnel. We simulate numerically the wind tunnel, the, the flow that we have in the wind tunnel to simulate the response and compare to our response to what the, the wind tunnel is going to tell us. So it is in in house code. Took forty years to build, uh, but it's a very very good tool. Right, thank you. All right, okay. one more question. Uh, when you talk about identifying changes in wind speeds, temperature, precipitation, ice accretion, how do you forecast out for 75 plus years? What are your top resources for making these long range predictions? It must be challenging to determine what level of conservatism to apply. That's a very good question, and uh, <laughs> I leave that, that's uh, there. <laughs> yeah, that that's a tricky part because um, you typically what we would do is look at different sources of data, surface level data, or there's different meteorological stations, or there may be data from national agencies uh, like in the United States, NCAR or NOAA. They might have slightly different National Weather Service and, or Environment Canada each might have a slightly different data set. Um, so you kind of got to challenge the data a little bit and attempt to sort of poke arguments in it to say which one is right. Is there a model that's better than another? Um, I would say, like I said before, most um, areas in North America and Western Europe uh, have very, very good data and most tend to converge one, to one another. Like if you look at the different airports in New York, there's four, including Teterboro, LaGuardia, JFK, and, and um, Newark. And then compared to the National Weather Service, they tend to compare fairly well um, and compare fairly well uh, to say a hurricane simulation for the area. But extrapolating out to the 75 years into the future or the 100 year return period or the 1000 year return period does require a bit of judgment. Uh, it is a challenge. It's even more so of, of a challenge with precipitation, uh, I would say, because it's influenced by temperature. And um, so it can be done. Uh, we do do it, but it, it's one of the one of the greater challenges without adding additional conservatism like the um, the author of the question stated. So it's it's as art as much as science, I would say. Great, thank you for that. And I, I must say that everybody who um, posted a comment was very um, uh, congratulatory on, on your presentation, excellent presentation. I uh, really want to, uh, um, to thank the two presenters as well as their teams uh, behind the scene uh, who have made this happen. And uh, Mike, uh, if you want to say a couple of closing words. I think it's time we signed off, but thanks. This has been a, a great first uh, Canada US IABC group webinar. Uh, you guys have set the bar fairly high and the people who are following are not gonna be so happy about that. Uh, but I've really uh, enjoyed the webinar and uh, I think a measure of its effectiveness, you got great questions. And so that was really good. So back to our day jobs. Thanks again, yeah. guys. Thank you. All. Thanks, everybody. Bye-bye. Happy Thank birthday, you. Maria. Happy birthday, Maria. Thank you. Bye-bye. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Bye-bye.